Welcome to TV Soap. Our very exciting guest today is Rebecca El Maloglu. Of course, you all know her from Neighbours, but we need to do a deep dive on her entire Aussie soap history. Beck, how are you? I'm great. You make me sound really old. <laughs> <laughs> We're not that old. I mean, but you have been around like since what, the early 90s? I reckon your first role on a soap is E Street. But before we go there, I want to ask you about the surname El Maloglu. It's, yeah. It's from your dad. Your dad's Greek. It's a Greek name, but your dad wasn't born in Greece? No. So it, look, the actual name itself is um, Greek Turk. But no, my dad was actually born and raised in France, in Lyon. Growing up, of course, his mother tongue was French, but also Greek with his family. And my mum's English. So... Yeah, it's um, it's a great name. I mean, I've been asked so many times over the years why, you know, why didn't you change it and simplify it, and make, you know, get a stage name. But I'm proud and I love it. And um, yeah, it's great. I mean, I have heard people mangle it over the years, but once no. you get it right, it, it does flow off the tongue easily. It, it's it's as phonetically, you know, like it's Elma Loglu. People like to add us, you know. Um, Elma Logalu, <laughs> Elma Loglu. Um, but no, it's just, it's exactly how it's written. It's actually quite simple. It's actually quite simple to say. But funnily enough, Andrew, though, um, my married name is Baker. <laughs> so I love it. I love the fact that, um, you know, all my day-to-day -day sort of running around, you know, the laundromat or uh, the dry cleaners, sorry, you know, uh, just Baker will do. Um, huh. I'll be there all day. <laughs> Tell us how Dame Judy Dench is your cousin. Presumably that's from your mother's side of the family. She's my mother's uh, second cousin. Um, so, um, yeah, she, um, and it's funny because they're all, they come, it's the Dench side of my family. So my grandmother and all her sisters or their neat or their uh, maiden names were Dench. But it's incredible. And even my mother, they all look absolutely identical like my mum is is very very similar looking to Judy um yeah so yeah it's lovely and um I'm actually really close friends with Binti her daughter usually most of the time when I sort of do trips over to London for work I, I try to catch up yeah it's lovely it's it's lovely to have that in the family how did young Rebecca get interested in wanting to learn about acting? I'm presuming you went and did singing and dancing and all that stuff. What was it that made you want to do that career? To be honest, I think I actually just sort of fell into it. Um, I did ballet when I was, you know, a child. And my ballet academy, which was run by a, a lovely woman called Valerie Tweedy, actually, no, she was, she was lovely, but she was very strict. <laughs> but her studios were closing down and she had to find a new um, place to basically teach out of. And the Keen kids, Linda Keen, who it's all, which is very different. I mean, she, you know, Valerie Tweedy, it was all very sort of all about ballet and that was pretty much it. I think she may have done a, a tap class here and there, or not her, but, you know. Um, but then we all sort of moved into the Linda Ke the Keen studios and that was all, you know, jazz, you know, fabulous shows and and jazz and tap and show, you know, the King Kids and, you know, it was all very, very different. And unfortunately, a lot of her students um kind of wanted to explore that, you know, wanted to leave the ballet classes, and we ended up sort of skipping the ballet and and wanting to go and do all the show busy sort of, you know stuff um so that was kind of sad so I was doing that but um look I always loved it came from the fact that I always loved the film The Sound of Music and still do to this day I've probably seen it about a thousand times I've even done the tour in Salzburg and cried the whole time um but just loved 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 the film and um I was eight years old and um there were they were holding auditions for the big production that was being held at the Regent Theatre in Sydney. And mum said, look, do you want to audition? And I was like, oh, okay. And I auditioned uh, with thousands of other budding young, you know, performers. And uh, myself and Justine Clark, um, we met. We got the job and we met and um, we became firm friends. And um, her mother sort of organised for me to get an agent and I just started working pretty solidly from the, the age of eight. And that's how it started. 
So a so couple actually, of things. I've worked out. I've been doing it for 40 years. Wow. Congratulations. 41st year of oh. being in the industry. <laughs> when you say Linda Keane, are you talking Linda with a Y? Linda Keane, the Australian actress? You know what? I think it may have been. Yeah. yeah. And it she was, was an actress L-Y. in Bellbird, The Box, but did a whole bunch of stuff like that. Yeah. Anyway, she started a talent school and, and um, her husband was a, uh, or is, sorry, um, you know, a, a club, you know, rides a, a, you know, does all the, the clubs, all the RSL clubs on a horse and he's the electric cowboy and sings, I'm a round storm cowboy. <laughs> so it was all very, you know, very not my family. <laughs> I came from a classical background, so um, yeah, it was very, uh, it was all new to us and very exciting as being kids. So before you were cast in E Street, you did have a role in one of the most iconic movies of all time, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Yeah, which although you know people go, yeah, you're a Mad Max, um, you know, so were a thousand other kids. There was fifty three of us. We were um, trained and workshopped and rehearsed you know, um, with the, the fantastic George Ogilvy. But certainly the children are the keystone of the film because the film is about the future. You know, it was an epic, an epic experience and incredible, amazing, amazing experience. When you get cast in East Street in 1989 to play a, a street kid called Simone, um, was this a big I deal? I remember like, her name. <laughs> <laughs> were, were you aware that East Street was a big show? Like, what? as a young girl... Were you watching these shows and then starring in them and going, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm here? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But also um, with East Street, um, I knew quite a lot of people who were series regulars who I actually happened um, to meet at the Linda Keane Studios, speaking of Linda Keane, um, which was Tony Perrin, who was an actual Keen kid, and Linda and Greg's daughter, Brooke. I think she was a much younger child on, on the show. So I knew a lot of the actors. Um, yeah, look, I mean, yeah, like any kid, I'm um, sure I watched, you know, watched um, many shows like East Street. Um, probably by then, um, because I'd been sort of working quite a lot by then, to me, you know, it was just another acting gig. But exciting, exciting at the same time. Um, but, yeah, it feels so long <laughs> so long ago I can't even I couldn't even remember the character I mean do you think that the East Street role was sort of like a a screen test in a way for Home and Away because in 1990 you're cast in Home and Away as Sophie Simpson and this becomes your really huge breakthrough role and Mm. where Aussies get to know you as a household name yeah well the thing about Home and Away was um I just got back from overseas working um, in Greece doing a children's series, an SBS children's series called Adventures on Kithara. Um, So I'd been sort of working on this amazing Greek island for, you know, quite a few months. Um, And I came back and I auditioned for a few things and one of them happened to be Home and Away. But initially it was only a a, a three-month guest uh, role uh, with Terence Donovan, Terry Donovan playing my father. Um, and like, I mean, it happens here on this show, you know, we, we get um, actors in to play to play guest roles all the time and, you know, if the producers love them and if their characters sort of go down quite well and, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of factors to it, um, they decide to sort of keep them on, which was um, what happened with Home and Away. But the thing about Home and Away is that there's, you know, there's only two soaps that we've ever really sort of had. I mean, from what I remember, East Street wasn't, was East Street a soap, like a five-day a week? It wasn't five days a week. It was on twice a week. It was two hours, Wednesday and Thursday night. So like country practice, you either did five half hours a week or you did two one-hour episodes like Sons and Daughters and sometimes some states would screen that as four half hours, you know. But basically you're making, where Aussie was always making two hours to two and a half hours of primetime TV. Yeah, it's a lot and and it's a lot to shoot for in one week. Um, um, And, look, I can't can't remember that. Um, But, um, you know, I mean, the the pace that we work uh, here is is incredible. In mind-blowing um 
and it, you know it's great training platform but yeah I, I mean look to be honest with you I can't really remember but I am pretty sure I would have had a good feel of of the pace of things working on East Street um and then you know I think I did country practice even before East Street actually um I, I was on country practice about three times or two or three times playing different roles over the years um but yeah, it's really it, you know it's it's interesting that the different paces and the amount of of uh, I guess footage that we we shoot every week, um, it's it's yeah it's a lot. We know the pace today is really really fast, but can you remember if it was slightly slower back then? Did you get more rehearsal time on Home and Away because you were young actors and there was maybe more consideration paid to you because of that? Look, when I first started Neighbours, we had we had rehearsal days. We don't anymore, um, but we certainly did on on Home and Away um, uh, two rehearsal days. Um, but then I, I seem to remember that you know we'd be in studio and we'd be shooting like twenty two scenes a day, which is a, a lot. Whereas we don't do so many here um you know i would say like a, a day that involves you know 11 or 12 scenes is is, is big, a big day um oh. and i guess sort of being an adult you tend to <laughs> one of the oldies one of the seniors um we tend to sort of have more dialogue than anyone else <laughs> well i certainly do i'm on 4f so i seem to talk non-stop um oh. and i feel like i'm in everyone's faces all the time um but yeah <laughs> um yeah it's um it's it's a lot um but um yeah no I think I just yeah I I feel like it it works faster nowadays than than what it used to what can you remember about your character Sophie on Home and Away I mean like all great Home and Away characters she was a bit of a delinquent I know she arrived in Summer Bay with her dad played by Mm -hmm. Terence Donovan but yeah great journey you take in home in a way is that you you might be a bad girl but you know Pippa's gonna turn you into a nice person as her foster mother always always yeah look um Sophie had her faults um but you know she was just a kid that had a a, you know a rough life with, with a dad and and uh you know was always on the road and um you know I think um you know, although it sounds cliche, you know, she found the, the um, you know, the, the Fletcher House, I think it was called first. Yeah. yeah it was called Fletcher House and, and uh, you know, life became much more settled for her. And, you know, we saw her growing up from, you know, a 14, 15-year-old to an 18, 19-year-old, you know, with a child. And, um, you know, I think uh, although she was a little rough around the edges at first, I think she, she grew up quite quite well. When you go looking for clips of you from those classic home and away years, um, what's there is the cat fight that Sophie has with Tracy, you know, which was the girl that she was jealous of moving into the home and yeah. in the bedroom. Have, and it, it actually looks like they use a stunt woman at, at one part because they don't see your face as you're thrown onto the bed and then all of a sudden there's a quick edit and up you come with your face <laughs> because you're young girls, right? I think we were. I can't remember any stunt stunt people. Yeah, we went for it. I think yeah. we did go for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know. Look, I I sort of seem to sort of see only clips. You know, the same sort of clips um, come up um, all the time. There's one of me and Kate. Um, you know, we both look so young. Um, but yeah, it's really nice because I, I do follow a few of the Home and Away. Um, you know, fan sites and stuff, and they're often posting stuff. Um, <laughs> it's just so weird. I love showing it to my son because, um, he, you know, it's, I was his age, so it's quite strange for him, I think. But it's also interesting because he's he's an actor now, so he, um, I think he, uh, I think, you know, he's like, oh, whatever, mom, you know, but I think deep down he's like, oh, God, yeah, oh, she's good, yeah, yeah, I should do that for him. <laughs> so I don't know. So the big storyline for Sophie is she gets pregnant after having a relationship with David, who is Mr Fisher's nephew, as played by the incredible Guy Pearce. We should actually point out, though, at the time Sophie was 16 and David was 26. I mean, you probably wouldn't do that storyline today. Yeah. Uh, Look, in the the storyline, they did take me away from the situation um, because, you know, Everyone felt that it was inappropriate, which, of course, it is. Um, 
um, but the actual storyline itself, um, look, I think back then we weren't, um, you know, um, it, you know, it's not. Well, it was a different era, right? It was a different era, very different era. Yeah. Um, but Rebecca thought it was fabulous. Yeah. I loved it. I loved the fact that Guy Pearce had come from Neighbours and had come up and, um, you know, it was a great It was a great storyline acting-wise from an acting point of view. Um, but, yeah, look, I, it would be an absolute no-no now, I guess. Um, but well, no, particularly yeah. because he impregnated you and then, of course, that became Sophie's big story, didn't it? The yeah. teenage mother who went through and had the baby and, you know, we went on that journey with her. I mean, it was it's it's tough being a single mother at any age, but I think Home and Away really kind of wanted to show that, you know, this is a, this is a big yeah. deal. And especially with David dying not that long, you know, I mean, not that long after they take Sophie out of the situation. Um, so yeah, it was yeah, um, yeah, it was rough. It was rough, and then I think she, you know she had the baby, and then she had to go out and get work. You know, she wanted to be independent. Mm. So it did show a, a side of you know um, what it was like to be a young teenage single mum, and uh, that was kind of like the sort of the beginning of my ex story, um, really, from the show. Um, but yeah, it was fun working with you know being pregnant, you know doing all the whole pregnancy thing and the birth and 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 working with the baby. You uh, joined Home and Away when it was absolutely a bona fide hit in the UK. What was the first time that you ever experienced you know the fan worship from Britain? Was it when you went over to do one of the pantos? You did yeah. Did you do Cinderella and Aladdin at some stage I, at Christmas? Yes, I did. my first pantomime um, was uh, Cinderella up in Sunderland and I was absolutely terrible and I got the terrible reviews, which was deserved because I was so crap at it. Um, next I did Aladdin, which I sort of went, oh, I can get a little bit better at this, you know. <laughs> and then the third year or the fourth year, uh, you know, um, I may have skipped a year, um, was Snow White, which I absolutely loved because I had a little black bob, bob at the time. And um, I sort of, you know, started getting, you know, getting the, the, the idea of panto. I think if you haven't experienced panto, pantomimes before, the English pantomime, um, it is very, um, very, very strange. Um, and so I think with, with Cinderella, I was just young and just like, huh? <laughs> what the hell? Um, but no, it, um, I, I, I really enjoyed the second and third ones that I did. But, yeah, it was crazy over there. And, you know, it still is. I mean, it's, you know, I just got back from London launching the show and, um, you know, the fact, they just love it. They just love it. I know you were much younger when you made Home and Away and, and you can work long hours and do all of this, but, you know, when you left Home and Away after doing it for several years, do you think that you're approaching a sort of a burnout? You've talked before about how, mm. you know, you were actually starting to struggle in those uh, with all of that fame so quick. I developed, you know, anxiety. Uh, I, I, you know, I started sort of... Um, uh, suffering from, you know, mental health issues. And um, I started getting, um, I was put on, I had terrible skin um, for a while there and um, the producers uh, sent me off to a um, dermatologist and I was put on this medication that that made me quite dizzy and um, it kind of made me feel weird. And it basically started giving me anxiety and started giving me panic attacks Um and I think, you know, that uh, on top of, you know, working very long hours, um, you know, um, created this uh, situation. I mean, there were other factors, I'm sure. But, um, but yeah, I've sort of been a, a big, um, you know, um, oh, look. And back then we weren't really allowed to talk about mental health. So I had to, every time um, I've been, you know, I was asked over the years by the media, you know, about it, uh, I think in my Wikipedia, yeah, it says that I have OCD, which, look, I might have a little bit of OCD, but, I mean, you know, without taking it away from, you know, people who really do suffer from OCD, um, I've always suffered from generalised anxiety. Um, and my panic attacks have, have gotten well under control nowadays. Um, but back then we weren't allowed to talk about it. It just was something that we weren't allowed, you know, and I remember even my mother saying, oh, don't, don't talk about it, you won't get work, and you know, um, 
And so I always felt it wasn't until I was sort of, you know, in the last sort of 10 years since actually joining Neighbours that I'm, yeah, I mean, actually I remember one of the big first media launches that I went to, somebody asked me about it and um, I remember sort of like, like kind of covering it up still even after all these years. Mm. And then I think the more people sort of, you know, people in the public eye started talking about their mental health issues and it's not something to be ashamed of and it's not something to be embarrassed about. And, you know, I think um, or I personally um, sh- shout it to the, you know, the hills um, and I'm more than happy to talk about it with media or anyone that will listen um, because it's so rife at the moment, especially since COVID. Um, but, yeah, back then, yeah, I, it was kind of a little bit of a burnout um, and, you know, to be honest, I've suffered from anxiety all my life. Um, you know, obviously, as you get older, you sort of, you know, um, try to manage it and um, in all sorts of different ways, which I have. And um, what's the best thing that's worked for you in terms of managing anxiety and panic attacks? Look, I'm not sure. I've been, I mean, I've been on medication for about 10 years now and um, a very mild, mild one. Um you know, yeah, I think that's worked. Um, I also think sort of, and look, this is this is just for me personally. I know for some others it, it can get worse after having children. I know my anxiety got was terrible after I gave birth to my child mm. to the point of my blood pressure went so much through the roof that he was um, released out of hospital before I was. Um, um, you know, but I think sort of maybe age and a more of an understanding of of what's going on with the physicality, the 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 the, the physical aspect of because mine was always very physical, um, and you know my panic attacks and 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 my anxiety it's always been you know um, you know it, it, it up here and it works both ways you know but um, yeah I. Um, I don't know, I guess sort of getting older and having more of an understanding. I mean, God, I've had enough therapy sessions to to, to, <laughs> to get an understanding of it. Although, you know, it, I've always said that even if you've had heaps and heaps of therapy and you know exactly what's going on, if you get an unexpected panic attack, all that goes out the window. And everyone who's listening to this, who's ever suffered a panic attack, it doesn't matter what you've learned, what you've practiced and whatever it's sometimes very hard to forget that um that you're actually not going to die and you know anyway um but yeah it's um it's interesting but yeah I was I was worked quite hard at that 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 stage of my life well done um after home and away you talked about a country practice before and it's interesting I mean every actor sort of did the the part one and part two of a country practice but you were actually in there for like five or six episodes playing a a, a singer called Christina, I think, and you actually helped escort Hugo, played by Gavin Harrison, out of the show. You were his exit storyline for him to fall in love with you and then leave Wandon Valley forever and hopefully live happily ever after. Ah, yes. So I, I yeah, I did quite a few. Um, yeah, I was on that for like eight weeks filming, eight weeks. For, yeah, for quite a while. Um, and Christina, um, she's a cancer cancer victim. Um, and it was a really beautiful storyline from what I remember. It was really lovely. And Gavin and I were friends from being kids. So we were just, and we were, you know, we were always, we were so close. So it was just such a lovely, um, lovely storyline for him to, to do his exit storyline. Um but, yeah, that was pretty much almost straight after Home and Away. A country practice and sons and daughters used to share the same studio. There was a bit of rivalry between them, you know, that country practice thought that they were doing something much more worthy than sons <laughs> and daughters. So I'm wondering, can you, can you remember going from Home and Away to a country practice? Was it a very different feel of the show or because uh, they were all being filmed at Channel 7 out at Epping back then, was it kind of the same? Well, it's funny you say that because I don't remember the home, the sorry, the sons and daughters, um, or the home and away country practice thing. I remember the home and away thing with the All Saints. That's, right. I remember a bit of like All Saints was a drama, and we were the soap. And I remember there was a little bit of you know, a little bit of a rivalry. Not rivalry. I mean, you know, but uh, they're in that studio and we're in this studio, right? You know. Um, but then not that long after I did a, a stint on All Saints as well and went back a couple of times, I think. So, um, you know, been around the block a few times. 
Yeah, it's always been there. I mean, that word soap, some shows go, oh, we're not a soap, we're a drama. You know, and it's like, listen, if you're finishing with a continuing storyline and picking it up again next week, you're a soap, you know. We can all live in the same field. I know. And it's so funny you say that because when I was younger, if if, if a soap star, Rebecca, I'm like, I would be furious. I'd be so upset. I'd be like, I am not a soap star, you know. And it was just that whole thing of pigeonholing and, blah, 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 and I'll never get work in film or anything else because of a pigeonhole because I'm so... Now I actually thrive on being a soap actress because it's actually a very niche. It's actually quite a, an art form, to be honest, without... And and not a lot of people are good at it. And I, um, you know, I feel like I've been doing it long enough that I, you know, it's kind of a little bit over the top. You're good at the drama, but you're also good at comedy. You've got to be, you know, um, you know, keep up the pace. It's got to be very casual. Work on instinct, um, you know. Um, and I, I thrive. I, I love being a soap actress because I'm bloody good at it. You know, I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't be here after ten years. I wouldn't be in this industry, you know, after forty years if I wasn't good at what I do. And it's really interesting because we get. Um, incredible actors come in and do guesties on the show, you know, film actors and theatre actors, and they're bloody good actors. But if they come they if they come into our sets and, and they work the pace that we do, we, we don't see see the best out of them. It's really interesting, actually. It's quite a, it's quite a, 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 a very, I'm not going to say specialised because we're not, you know, like, it's not like we've, I don't know. But it is, it is, it's, it's quite a, um, not everyone can do it, put it that way. Well, that's for sure. I've, I've interviewed so many soap stars and, you know, I talk to some of the American daytime stars and go, why do you do this? And they all say to me, usually without fail, we do soaps daily because we get to act every day. If we were making a TV show or a movie, we're sitting around all day to film yes. one minute. But here we get to act from nine to five and it and keeps our muscles working. And the adrenaline, you know, I love working, you know, on the adrenaline and working off my instincts. We mm. we don't have time to sit and dwell and overthink stuff. <clears throat> and I don't think you're going to get the best performance out of people if you overthink things. I mean, it's for me, it's as simple as that. Look, a lot of actors might think that I'm a little bit too flippant. I break, you know, I'll, I'll be joking about one second with the crew and then I'll go straight into it. But that's only because that's how I work. You know, I could do a full-on crying scene, hysterical scene, like I did half an hour ago or an hour ago, and just walk out there and just be like, wow, Beck's back. Um, you know, for me, it's, you know, um, and, you know, it's regular work. <laughs> you know, I pinch myself every day how lucky I am that I'm working full-time. There are not many actors um, in this country that are doing that. Um, so, and I just love the pace of it. And I love the fact that, I, I you know, I... I've got a myriad of, of storylines. Like one minute someone's died and it's like, oh, and then the next minute I'm, you know, doing something really bloody stupid. <laughs> you know, it's great. You know, it, it's kind of fulfilling all my, and especially with this character, of course, Therese. I mean, you know, I mean, she's fabulous. She's bloody great. Um, so, you know, I get to have a lot of fun. Now, before we get to Therese, I want to go back to 1995 because I was the location manager for Paradise Beach and it was my job to go off and find this caravan park and get a corner where we could film and set up this kind of area for this goth character, this new character who smoked. Constantly. Do you know what? That was so interesting because Paradise Beach used to screen in Australia at 5.30 p.m. And I specifically remember the script writers, you were allowed to smoke during children's TV on Australia if you were a bad girl. So that's how you were allowed to smoke on Paradise because you were leading Tori, as played by the beautiful Megan Connolly. You were leading her astray, giving her alcohol, giving and and but you were allowed to smoke on Paradise Beach. I know, I know. It's disgusting too, by the way. Um, that's why nobody really smokes on film television anymore. Uh, well, besides the fact that it's bad for you, but... um. 
Oh my God, it was just revolting. Um, but speaking of Paradise Beach, just quickly, Jason Herbison, who of course you know very well, our wonderful executive producer, sent me a wonderful photo of there was Isla and Megan and Melissa Bell and myself, and we were all having dinner. And I had such a great time doing that show. It was really fun. Um, um, although, you know, there was a lot of smoking and I was working in a caravan the size of, <laughs> so, but it was great fun. That was Isla Fisher's first TV show. It certainly was, yeah, and then she and, went on home and away afterwards. And I remember her celebrating her 18th birthday and we are in the, there was a gay bar in Surface Paradise and she was up dancing on the bar going, I'm 18, I'm 18. And the bartender was like, will you tell her to stop saying that? She's been coming in here for the last six months. <laughs> yes. So oh, to, yeah. to stick with the Gold Coast theme, you go from Paradise Beach to Pacific Drive. Yeah. On Pacific Drive, you know, to me this was a storyline that they really burned through far too quickly. You know, they mm. had the character played by Steve Harmon. He discovered his long-lost father was a politician, Bill Garland, played by Chris Haywood, and you played the daughter of this politician, Eliza. But, of course, there was a really nasty element to this storyline. Do you remember what it was? Yes, it was awful. Um, and it was quite full on to film as well. So it was an incest storyline. Um, and basically uh, Chris's character was um, sexually assaulting his daughter, Eliza. Um and it was very fun. It was really quite, and also, you know, me being quite young too, having to sort of film those sort of scenes, um, you know, uh, was quite full on. Um, although I had my very, this is interesting, um, I had my very real first kiss on TV in an American production called Emma, Queen of the South Seas with a boy filming and it was my first ever kiss and I had to do it in front of crew and on TV. It was just so like, ah. Um, so, you know, I've been put in sort of un uncomfortable situations, um, you know, a few times in my in my childhood, but obviously things now with intimacy coaches and all that sort of thing is it's very, very different, which is which is great. Um, but yes, this storyline um in Pacific Drive was full on. And then the poor girl ended up dying on the dance floor after taking uh, ecstasy. So it was, um, it was a bit depressing really, wasn't it? It, it? it all just felt really rushed to me. It was like they, they built up this whole family um, for Steve Harmon and then, you, you know, you were dead on the dance floor in the nightclub from ecstasy and uh, Amber went off and uh, set up uh, Chris Hay Haywood and um, made out that he tried to rape her so that he could be sent to prison. So he got his comeuppance from it. But I just thought, you know, why bring yeah. family played by such great actors, you and yeah. Chris Haywood, and, yeah. you know, but chew you up within a couple of weeks, it felt like. I know, I know. It's a shame sometimes when that happens. But, you know, I think when, you know, the writers are in the writer's room, they they don't, you know, I mean, things have got to be done in 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 quick time. You know, yeah. like in soap, obviously, obviously, you know, with these shows, um, you know, people get their degrees in three weeks, and you know, um, unfortunately, sometimes I think they just don't know how 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 well you know a storyline is going to go, or you know, it's sometimes hard to sort of, I mean, yeah, to how it's going to play out, I guess. Um, I was particularly offended because after you'd come and gone so quickly in Pacific Drive, they hired your brother, Dominic, to play a character. And his storyline was he was a little boy, a nipper, getting molested by his life-saving coach played by John Orchick. And I'm like, can we leave the Elmer Logaloos alone? Like, <laughs> seriously. Oh, my God. I didn't even know that. Oh, my God. And John Orchick played my boyfriend in a play called Caravan um Dave, and David Williams a play at the Opera House quite a few years later or earlier I don't know I can't remember um oh god oh my god yeah that's 
full on. Oh, poor Dominic, I must talk to him about that. <laughs> yeah, he, <laughs> hopefully he's uh, blanked that from his mind. But let's get to present. So you've been in Neighbours now, well, 10 years, really, a decade. You were yeah. cast in 2013 as Therese and you've been on such a wild ride. How, how is Neighbours different? Because I know you had to relocate from Sydney to Melbourne mm-hmm. to do this role, but, you know, clearly you love it. You're still there and you've come back for the reboot. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I actually originally auditioned for um, the character Lauren Turner who was played by the lovely Kay Kendall, who's now one of our fabulous directors. Um, and I actually got quite close. I mean, I was sort of done quite a few recalls and, um, you know, I was sort of, it was between me and somebody else, which turned out to be her. And um, and they gave the role to her, but they came back to me and said, listen, we've got another character, another family coming in called Therese Willis, uh, uh, the Willis family, um, and this character, Therese Willis, is coming in and we feel as though you would be much more suited to it. Um, so sit tight and we'll get back to you. And um, sure enough, a month or two later, they got back to me. Um, I did a, a quick, um, you know, a quick read for it. Um, and then uh, they flew me down to meet the kids who were playing the kids. And I got the role and it was kind of all a bit, um, I was like, oh, God, I could never do three years. I, I'd just do one year and, you know, and then I was going to commute. I oh, commute, you know, and I had a three-year-old child at the time and I was like, <gasps> And then it wasn't until not that long before um, my husband just woke up one morning and went, no, we're, and it was ended up being three years. The idea was that I was going to commute for six to 12 months and then we'd see how it goes. But my husband was like, no, we're, we're all going to go. Um, we're all going to come down to Melbourne. So we came down and 10 years later, here we are. Although when the show did end last year, um, I don't know if you know this, Andrew, I, um, we sold our house and, and we moved up north and so I could be with my family and just, um, yeah, just have a bit of change of scenery and um, was having a lovely old life up in, the, up in a little country town, you know, walking the dogs on the beach and just chilling out. And then the show was back on and nope, we're packing up the house, we're moving back to Melbourne and here we are. How long did it take you to say yes to come back to the reboot? Was it yes oh. straight away or did you have to talk it over with the family? No, I just instantly was like, oh, good, my job's back. It didn't even occur to me that they might possibly not want me. Um, (laughs) I mean, look, we were a bit spun out by it, I have to admit. Um, So, you know, um, there was it was one evening and I was just settling down with my husband and son to watch one of our, you know, shows and, and my phone started beeping. It was the cast thread and some of the kids were like, oh, my God, we're hearing rumours. The show's back. Blah, blah, blah. You know, all this sort of silliness. And I was just like, oh, whatever. You know, it's just rubbish. It's not happening. So I turned my phone down, turned the lights and started watching the show. And then about half an hour later, I kind of was like, and I kind of got my phone. I was sort of lifted it up. And sure enough, there was a message from Jason to all of us saying, hey, all. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard, but we've got some amazing news. The show's back. It's being announced, officially announced in an hour in the UK, blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, ah! I was just going crazy. And I rang Jackie straight away. And, of course, Jackie and and Stefan and, and Ryan and, and Fletch, Alan Fletcher, um, you know, they had already had, they already knew for a few days. Um and yeah, and I was texting Jay. I was like, oh my God. Like, it was so bizarre. It was just so bizarre. Um, and then Jason rang me the next morning at eight o'clock in the morning and just said, look, sit tight. Um, uh, you know, we've got to get approval for everyone from Amazon, um, but you're our number one favorite, um, obviously, besides the four heritage. Um, so, you know, I, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you're in. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, so that's, um, so it was amazing. It was wonderful. It was so exciting. But it was, it was a big upheaval. I'm not going to say it was easy. Um, you know, my husband sort of got a little unwell last year. So I was sort of having to care for him. It was a big, uh, you know, packing up our lives, moving up there, then packing up our lives, moving back down. Um, and we're still sort of settling in a little bit too. And we'll see what happens with the show, whether we, you know, stay down here or not. Um, but, yeah, it was exciting. And, yes, I 
completely assumed that I was just part of the show. Before you know, we get into the jaw-dropping twist of the new chapter of Neighbours that you're such a huge part of, what what was one of your favourite storylines of Therese over the last 10 years? Has it been the alcoholism, the breast cancer, losing your son when Lassiter's blew up, or is it all those men you've slept with? Paul Robinson, his son Leo, and his half-brother Glenn. I mean, you know, you're like Brooke Logan on The Bold and the Beautiful sleeping with all the men in the Forrester family. I know, and I love it. I love <laughs> it. It is so much fun, I swear to God. Like. Look, I'm very happily married, Andrew. I am very happily married in a very rock solid relationship. My marriage is very important to me, but God, it's fabulous working with wonderful, good looking actors. <laughs> no, 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 I'm joking. Um, well, not really. I am. I'm, I, I am. I'm not. But um, oh, look, there's so many. As you know, as I said before, we get to play with so many amazing storylines. You know, the the the, the breast cancer storyline was was amazing but my mum had just had breast cancer as well and of course Jason and the writers they called me into to a meeting and said look you know um we're aware that your mum's just had breast cancer how would you feel if we did something similar would you embrace it or would you you know, you know do we not touch it and I was like of course let's just do it let's do it um so that that was amazing in 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 a very different way um the alcoholism storyline, you know, um, was yeah, was 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 great. Um, oh, you know, like they're all, it's great. I mean, look, the thing for me is that I've just been so blessed um, to be able to work with. The, the, I was going to say all the men in my life, which is true because I do work mostly with men. I do have occasional storylines with somebody, somebody like Jackie, who's just wonderful. Um, but with Steph and Dennis and, and um, you know, him and I can, you know, we can do it with our eyes closed. We can read off each other perfectly, um, you know, where we have a lot of fun. It's hysterical. Um, and, but then currently I'm working with the lovely Ryan Maloney, who, you know, is so different to working to Stefan. Um, but we're having a great old time and kind of getting to know each other because we've really had nothing to do with each other for the last 10 years. Well, this so, is what I want to know. When yeah. did you find out that Neighbours would be rebooted and that they would let the audience think that she was going to remarry Paul, but at the very last minute at the cliffhanger, this jaw-dropping twist, you're actually getting married to Toadie. So I want to know, were you told that in advance or were you sitting at a table read and everyone turned the page and just went, what? <laughs> so they flew me down this was you know um uh, you know a month or two before we started shooting before I moved back down they flew me down because Jason Herbison our executive producer wanted to see the look on my face face to face he didn't want of to do it of course he did that cheeky he didn't lad. Want to do it over Zoom. He wanted to see the look on my face and I gave him what he wanted. I just like absolutely just squealed and was just like, oh my God, it was the last thing, the last thing I thought he was going to say. Um, and then he was like, okay, and uh, the car's waiting for you to take you to your wedding dress fitting, your first fitting. And I was just like, what? Like, it's just crazy but there you have it we had another wedding and yeah it was amazing I was thrilled look I, at first I was just like really like what I guess like all our viewers are probably still doing now and it's going to take them a while to get used to um but I tell you what the producers of love are loving loving Therese and Toadie and you know I think that the viewers although they're probably still getting used to not just Therese and Toadie but the whole show I mean you know yeah it's different um but it's still got the same essence that Neighbours has always had you know we weren't going to take that away there was no point giving our audiences a show that wasn't Neighbours but we did have to make some fresh changes and that means um, removing some you know some characters and and bringing some fresh faces in and it's just the way it is. Um, and, you know, like I'm a creature of habit, um, you know, so I get it, you know. It would spin me out if my favourite show, you know, was, was rebooted and came back slightly different. Mm. But I think in time everyone will get used to it. Um, but, yeah, I was just like, oh, 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 and Toady, like, what? <laughs> just, ow, ow, ow. 
Um, but when we um, come to some episodes down the track a little bit, um, things will sort of be a little bit clearer. But yeah, I was I was thrilled, and I was yeah, as I said, I, I hardly I mean I knew Ryan of course, but we sort of you know did a few scenes here and there, and you know we we're all colleagues, but we'd never sort of worked closely together. So I was kind of a little bit nervous about it, um, but also up for the challenge. Um, you know, you get so used to working. Um, you know, Cyprian and I was so used to working with each other that it almost you know. I, I, I wouldn't get slack. I wouldn't sort of say I'd get slack, but you know, like I needed a bit of a bit of a change, bit of a you know, something to you know, uh, yeah, yeah, something different. I mean, I'm I'm so glad that I'm getting to speak to you and you're back filming Neighbours because you know I I, I watched you take the axing so hard yourself. You spoke out in defence of the crew, and I'll tell you, sir, I've never told you before that mm. appalling logies that you went to. Wow. Your cast was treated so badly. You were seated right at the back of the room, and the only right. person seated in a worse seat than that was the judges and the prize winners. So I was actually sitting behind you and I'm like, oh, there's Beck. I'm going to go up and say hello to her in the commercial break. But, of course, I was seated directly behind you. So I couldn't see the stage either. And I'm like, hang on, they've sat the cast of Neighbours in front of two cameras so they can't see the stage. And I was just watching the body language of all of you as that night dragged on and on. It's like I I can't go over and speak to them. I felt so awful for you that you'd been put into that spot. And there was just it was just so awful in the aftermath of that axing Mm -hmm. that they paid you such disrespect that night at the Logies. I mean, that was an awful night, right? Yeah. Look, it, it's, it's it, it, yeah, it, it is. And, you know, for the last few years that we do get invited to the Logies, we are always, always at the back of the room. Um, even this most recent one, we had our backs to the room. Um, Channel 10 try and look after us as much as possible, and that's lovely. Um it's just it's just embarrassing. I just, you know, I just got back from London and went to, you know, an awards night where I was there with Tim Carno, who plays Leo, and we were, and I'm not saying it's about being treated like kings, you know, like, like well, but the media are just so giving and the fans are just so amazing Um and they're just, everyone wanted to speak to us. All the media along the red carpet wanted to, to speak to us. Whereas in Australia, and especially that that year um, when that happened, uh, which was last year, we were, and look, it, I don't know who decided that it was a good idea at the time, I'm not sure, but we were put first on the red carpet to walk down. Not one media outlet wanted to speak to us. My God, that's but horrendous. We walked past all these people, even people who I've met and been interviewed with in the past, nobody. And it happened this year as well, except it was much busier, so it wasn't so noticeable. Um, nobody wanted to speak to us at all, and then we get put at a table. Um, you know, I, I want to be careful what I say because I don't want to upset anyone, um, you know, um, at all, um, so I have to be diplomatic, and I'm not the most diplomatic person at best of times. Um, but you know, put at a terrible table. Um, a, the package, you know, we we were expecting a bit, a, a bit more of a, a special sort of um, video, you know, package. But it was something that had been played twenty times already that week. Um, we, I had, you know, um, Ryan Maloney on one side of me and Alan Fletcher on the other side of me, and they had to actors who had been on the show years and years and years and years ago up on stage doing the whole Neighbours thing when we could have had these two amazing actors be up there. And we were so shocked. (laughs) And I actually didn't realise that there was a camera on us. So apparently I was just like, like gobsmacked. Our poor publicist, who's just divine, um, Christy was just like, we we were all we were all just quite shocked and upset, but you know what we're used to it. Um, but you know we've all got jobs and we've got our jobs back, and 
you know, I said to everyone that was going to the Logies this year, a lot of people didn't want to go. Um, but I just said, come on, guys, we've got our jobs back. Let's hold our chins high. I went down, as I do every year, and go as I say hi to the home and away tables that every single cast member is invited. We only get five invites. Um, they take up two or three tables and I'd go down and I'd say hello to them, to, you know, uh, Ray and Emily and, and Lynn and, and Georgie. Go, I always do. I'd go down and say hello. Uh, and then i walk back to my table at the back and we just try and enjoy the night. Um, but, yeah, it is, it's a little disappointing, um, you know, if if the media saw how we're treated um, in the UK, yeah. Well, I think that's the big difference, right? I think in the UK, uh, the the media there know that Neighbours is a great show. They well, every, Everyone should know now after the reaction to the end of Neighbours that it holds a very strong emotional part of people's childhoods and their lives. And yet it still feels to me like the Australian media is always going to be looking for the negative story to tell about Neighbours, whereas yeah. the UK press, and I mean, look, you know what, you guys are having the last laugh. You're the number one show on Amazon free V at the moment. And I mean, that's the important part. They're the ones making the show and yeah. you're giving them now what they want. So I think you're probably always going to have a bit of an issue with the Australian media, but look, the yeah. UK are always going to treat you better. Yeah. 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 And, um, you know, we're working and um, we're loving our jobs and, you um, you know, we've we've got an audience um, that loves the show and that's, you know, I'm happy to be here for a good another 10, 20 years. You know, that's, I don't know, yeah, it's a weird, it's, it's, it's a weird one. If you're there for another 10 to 20 years, I'll be watching. I've loved everything you've done over the years. I've loved getting to meet you and work with you and I want to thank you so much for coming on to TV Soap and talking about all those great roles. I'm going to have such fun this afternoon looking for that footage of you smoking in Paradise Beach. I know I've got it somewhere here. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, you must send it to me. I want to see it. I want to see it, definitely. Thank, Thank you, Rebecca Elmer-Logley. Thank you. Anytime. Bye.